and welcome to the In General Podcast, episode 86. This is the Jurassic Outpost Podcast, and if you haven't seen already, we've opened our store. Head to JurassicOutpost.com forward slash store. We're selling a bunch of stuff, including a new retro classic Jurassic line designed by our very own James McQuaid. Um, we also have a new partnership with Frome. They offer a, well, we're offering a 10% discount on their products. If you use coupon code Jurassic Outpost, all the links are in the description. Check out their site. There's some really, really cool stuff on there. Check out the store. I'm joined today with Chris and Ryan. How are you doing, guys? Hey, I'm good. Doing pretty good. How about doing yourself? Well. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm trying to figure out this uh, this whole introduction thing, you know, so it's seamless. Uh, it's not there That was yet. actually... No, no, man, that was great. I mean, before we, you know, you you did one take before. This is why you were born to be, you know, in production. Because before you did like this 10 second, you're like, wait, 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 no, no, no. And then all you needed was a little, and then you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, pff, dude, you just flew into it. So oh, well, thank you, Ryan. Here we are. I appreciate that. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I find it hard. But you know what? I'm actually really enjoying this um, this return to the podcast. We, we've come back and we're actually keeping the consistency up. Something that dropped out and i'm not going to blame anything it, except for fallen kingdom for that <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's, it's uh, i think it's it's brought the fun back that we have been missing for a little bit um just even talking about jurassic park uh hasn't been as fun lately and i think part of it was uh one of our main ways of just kind of processing stuff was through the podcast and having fun with it as a group and really dissecting it as a group kind of happened organically on the podcast Agreed. Mm-hmm. And it's nice. Mm-hmm. It's come back and we've we've updated things a little bit. And if you are watching, uh, if you're listening in audio, but you want to kind of see what it is we're talking about, the video on YouTube now have uh, have visual references inside of them. Inside of them. So um, <laughs> check that out if you want that listening experience. And we're also now on Spotify, which is great. I have absolutely no idea why it took so long for us to get on Spotify. Um, we- and I don't even mean the application process. I just mean we didn't do it. <laughs> We yeah, just, no, we were like a long time ago, we were like, oh yeah, we need to do this. We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it took like we just accepted minutes. the fact that we never did it for the <laughs> longest time. We're like, yeah, we really should get to that. Jack, you had it online and like, it went from like, ah, oh, fuck it, let's figure out how to do it. And then like three seconds later, you're like, okay, you should be able to listen to an episode now on Spotify. <laughs> I was like, what? It was good. Why was it so quick. easy? I know. They've actually got a really um really easy system. The only other thing we're trying to work out is when Google changed their uh news platform maybe a year ago, we got dropped off of Google News because you had well, to then apply for like the publishing center and things like that. So I've done all that, but we weren't coming up yesterday for the the Lowry news. To Lowry. to compound that a little bit more is I think when we switched servers, so now that we're on a new server, Google also stopped pinging us as much. So we gotta yeah. figure that out. Yeah. Tech stuff. Yeah, tech stuff. Lots of lots and lots of fun. Um, Ryan. Hi. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing well, man. Yeah. It's a little early on the West Coast. Um, but you know it's not that early actually. What oh, is it, seven forty there? It is seven forty AM. But yeah, like I told Jack, I get I get up between like usually usually five and seven, so I guess 6 a.m. would be the median. <laughs> Crazy times. Uh, but this yeah, is what we I used like to it. do, man. We always used to have to try and figure out the time codes for three three or four different time zones. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it always seems to kind of work. Like, I mean, what time is it? It's three, four? Yeah, it's nearly four o'clock, yeah. It's all good. Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like that's always a good time of the day to jump on a pod. I don't know. That's what I, at least I have on my calendar, like... 3 to 4 p.m. Um, pod, say for podcast time, question mark. <laughs> Every <laughs> single day, you write that in by hand. <laughs> Just perpetually. But Chris, 10 a.m., we like, we hit him up last night. Yo, man, 10 a.m. podcast, your time. You're like, oh, my God, you guys are killing me. That's the first thing he <laughs> says. I like biggest eye roll on my side. I'm like, oh, my God. Hey, listen, I'm it's like, all a matter, <laughs> matter of perspective of how, how much sleep you're getting any time could be an early time in the morning. You just got to get used to it. It's true. So it's as true. far as I'm concerned, I'm getting up at 6 a.m. also. <laughs> this is your 6 a.m. Uh, <laughs> no, no. My schedule was good for a while, and uh, I let it go. And it yeah. just, I want to sleep. I think it was hard I think everybody's for people to get used to, you know. You, oh, yeah, I became. Time, just not being able to leave your house. It's kind of the same as, like, not being able to see daylight. Oh, I've you become I mean? an insomniac. It's, it screws you, yeah. You just stay up later mm-hmm. and later. 
Yeah, no, I've been, I definitely do that because I think I'm getting less out of my day. So I'm just constantly trying to find a way to stretch my day at home and like make it seem worthwhile. And I've just become an absolute fucking insomniac, like talking to people, drawing, watching TV shows, listening to music. Like, I don't know. It's just like, trying I just to get don't stop. I don't <laughs> stop. And then if I stop, I'm like, oh, I need more. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's that struggle to not be able, like to be able to relax properly. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to get stuff done. But um, yeah, we have some exciting things to talk about today. So obviously, um, if you're a continuing listener, you'll realize that, you know, we dropped a podcast yesterday and just before it dropped, there was new news. So that was kind of annoying. Um, we definitely, and it's funny, we actually said in the other, the uh, previous episode, we said that this picture of the Isla Sauna um, crate that Colin uh, dropped that'll tide us over for a long time you know we don't need anything else and we weren't expecting anything else and then the next the, like two days later the new york times dropped an article so this article was was about uh it, it was it was very pandemic heavy it was talking about how they're filming and, mm-hmm. and how they're dealing with it right it was super in depth I, I mean it's the times i just want to rewind to something real quick um <laughs> About the uh, Isla Sorna crate picture, is this the context of me discovering that was really, really funny. Um, I was camping with some friends, and I had zero reception. And uh, so my one friend, she suddenly got reception. I used, we used her phone to do a hotspot, and I hopped online. And everyone was talking about, like in chats, like an Isla Sorna picture or something like that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm freaking out. I'm like, where? Where is this? Where is this? And I asked somebody, and they're like, it's your website's exclusive. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> I was like looking at like Colin's page and everything like that. I was like, "What? I've, I've been gone for like fifteen hours. What? What happened in this past like fifteen hours?" It, it, it was... is funny that when the the big things like that drop, when you you of all people are not there, like you're out, I was, you're gone. I was exactly. so confused, you're for grit, man. <laughs> I was gonna say, how many times? Like, we we could go through probably at least fifteen different podcasts in the past where Chris talks about I was fishing, <laughs> and all of a sudden. This news dropped. Well, I didn't know that the news dropped, but of course you're out. You're either camping or fishing, but it's always the same. It's like sent. Like we'll have to just send Chris out into the woods if we're getting a little news deprived. Yeah, it's like this. It's kind of like this rain dance that the Jurassic community will start doing. It's like it's Chris the sacrifice. <laughs> and the hell, I mean, Chris, send, you you two saw me out there. I was uh, wrangling with some wildlife. There was the uh, that that was a big timber rattlesnake. Yeah, what did you do? I saw that picture. I, um, it was in I, the road, right? Yeah, I got it out of the road because I didn't want it getting run over. Did it chase you? It's very nice of you. Uh, it it faint. It made a faint strike at me, um, and it kept hissing and rattling, obviously. But eventually, it gave up and went off into the brush, and I was happy because I nearly ran it over, which is what convinced me to stop, pull over, and get it out of the road. That's good of you, Chris. We didn't and encounter. Plus, any... I wanted to admire a giant timber rattlesnake. Yeah, we didn't encounter any when we were on the road trip. Yeah, that was shocking to find it in Pennsylvania of all places. And then I ran into the elk later, um, big, big elk, which once again I've never seen like in the wild in Pennsylvania. So it's weird seeing these things that I typically associated with like, like further adventures out, like in my own state, like three hours from my house. Like that was just guess, sort of like shocking to me. I guess because of the lockdown, man, they've all been coming out, like yeah, t- taking nah. more of a step into society. <laughs> Yeah, but in, in America, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure if we've, uh, especially middle of PA, they uh, wouldn't take their lockdowns seriously. You got a, you got a dirty look if you uh, wore a mask out there. Hey, speaking of masks, I've seen quite a few pictures now of people not even, you know, saying like, hey, check out my new mask. Just people in the wild wearing an outpost mask. And it's so, there's something so cool about that. Like seeing, you know, something we put up uh, available online. And then somebody's just wearing it. It's so cool. Yeah, I love the one that James made of the uh, of the DNA sequence. Yeah, the DNA sequence is awesome, man. Actually, that's a good point. So if you are if you're listening and you did order a DNA sequence and when it arrived the print wasn't great, Redbubble had a bunch of issues with our original artwork, but they didn't tell us that, so everything was approved mm. on the site. So we've actually updated that now and we've ordered a couple, and the new they look great. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. So if you did have a, a one of those masks, I did want to point out. Um, it's been revised. Go, yeah, go through back through Redbubble. They should be able to give you either a credit or your money back. And then, if you still wanted one, order the new version because it is a lot better. But yeah, James just 
keeps smashing it out. I mean, the, he's on fire. The retro JP thing when he sent that through. Like usually, what happens is we all concept an idea, or James comes up with something, and then we we'll all work on it, throw in a few ideas, maybe a couple of revisions here and there. But he sent mm-hmm. that JP thing through, and we were like, "That's it. It's done." Yeah, <laughs> you did it first mm-hmm. time. Like even the ad itself. Usually, we have like wording we want to change or something, but it was just like, "Yep, that's it. Send it. That's the one. Post Send it. it." The one thing I hope that Dominion keeps in the marketing in this go round is the red Mm -hmm. because when when james throws up that classic just the classic logo up on there with like i mean just the black and the and the rex um face coming down that's so that's all uh, that's all i really need to see but at the same time like it does give me it gets me really psyched for the next because it kind of it throws me back but it it also just has such a cool modern feel to it agreed like his uh, billboard um concept that he did that just says 2021 that is the best marketing that universal will never do oh it's mm. it's, it's so tight and it's so jp but also modern enough that it would fit with the new films but it's just absolutely you, all that you're gonna see on the billboards is chris pratt and a, and a big blue like you know what number. i want to talk about how short-sighted that's been for using chris pratt and blue as like the primary marketing like the iconography the visual iconography for the jurassic world franchise is like they're basically plastered on everything even things they're not related to um and like they're on the new jurassic park like the jurassic world legacy collection toys it's still uh owen and blue yeah what's that about man um yeah and the, is he's not well, it's, so, it's so probably, short-sighted right? no not in the amber collection but it's so short-sighted because this this is coming from universal it's not from mattel it's universal that's asking all these brand properties to put the, that iconography on there but the problem is, is they're not with this franchise forever you don't want to make the face of your franchise be somebody that you're going to lose probably with jurassic world dominion i i think that he's probably going to step away and do other projects um, so yeah, I don't I understand. So well. And then uh, just on terms of like narrative level of like storytelling, it's not that compelling to lock yourself in. So I don't know why they haven't been using the T-Rex as their brand iconography for the most part. I understand movie posters and whatnot. There are certain expectations today. Um, I think there's better ways to pull them off. But nonetheless, I do understand that Owen and whatnot has to be on the poster. But yeah, I don't know. It just seems like a really short-sighted mistake that's going to leave their brand feeling it's going to be lacking a a spotlight other than the logo itself. It's going to lack a beacon that people can automatically gravitate towards. So it's going to be harder to hmm. sustain it after the world trilogy ends because of that marketing gimmick. Yeah. I think if anything, Blue, just Blue, have, having her be the... I mean, Blue I, is, I think, the face of the franchise more than Owen or the Rex would be. Um I think the Rex was pretty much the iconography and a lot of the marketing that we saw in the previous franchise. Mm-hmm. And even though she's still, you know, very much a part of this one, Blue is the face, in my opinion, of Jurassic World. I su- and not not having Owen in it, I totally agree. Um, but I think Owen, or I think just having Blue on there. I um, suppose that makes sense. But like the T Rex, the Jurassic Park T Rex theoretically like never changes. Obviously, that's not entirely true, true but. Theoretically, it never changes. So that's something that I think that across all films, no matter where the story is going, it's timeless and it resonates It resonates with every film. So I think that that's like a really good brand iconography and character mascot to have. And the problem with Blue is she's genuinely like a character character. She's not a type of raptor. She is one <laughs> individual raptor. So again, if you tie your franchise like to her face, you're suddenly going to be lacking a certain what people associated with the franchise as it pushes forward without her assuming that do they do not feel like the rex is the character no i mean not, I not in I'm the talking... context of blue but i no, mean no because i'm talking the rex design for the most part uh you have jurassic park you have then the lost world um yes jurassic park three three those two have two different female rexes that look the same and then you have jurassic world fallen kingdom obviously there's a little bit of design difference and whatnot but it's still the same thing jp3 obviously has the male rex and they look similar enough that they still it's been a consistent face in every film the jp3 rex the when the first time we see it right that's the same animatronic mold at least from the lost world Yes, that yeah, is the, bull. the same Stan, the on the buck. Stan Winston's. Yeah, and mm-hmm. we, um, they repainted it. Yeah, um, but and it's it, the and same. It's, uh... it's never been. I know this is like one of those questions that people always ask, but it, it it's not the. It's never confirmed whether it was or was not the baby from the Lost World, but that's a pretty cool idea, right? 
the uh, that's the idea that IOM <laughs> operated behind. They shrunk yeah. the 3D model because um, the idea was it was not a full adult male Rex. Um, so he's a little smaller than he should have been in the fight. Should have had um, some, something more obvious about its leg. That would have been cool. You know, I don't like the idea of it being that Rex. It sort of seems mean spirited. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's had a really <laughs> tough uh, life, that Rex. <laughs> but I do like the idea of it being a young Rex. Yeah. And I do sure. like the idea of like supporting the idea that they're, they're not like just three T Rexes. Like, there's a population of them on Isla Sorna, which also helps sell just the size of that island and that ecosystem. Yeah. Agreed. Not anymore, though. That island's wiped out. Um, should we talk about Sauna? Should we talk about these? Uh, should we talk about these set pictures? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> well, we don't, we don't have to. We can talk about something else. I mean, I mean, if we have to. But... <laughs> so the, no, these yeah. are the first things that have come out. I think that have excited me. Um, you know, properly. I got a proper. As soon as I, I opened the article that Chris linked, the New York Times one, it opens with that set picture. And Chris Pratt and the, is it DeWanda? DeWanda. I believe that's DeWanda Wise, which uh, from what we know from Toys, I, she will be p playing a pilot, and her name is Kayla. What a wonderful name, DeWanda Wise. So you can see the crane, you can see the Panavision, the camera, you can see the guy with the boom pole and the mic and the mask. More, most importantly, way, he's wearing a mask, looks, everybody. Who mm -hmm. looks, I just want to point out, could be Stephen Ray Morris. Yeah, it could very well be <laughs> Stephen Ray Morris with some grip tape on his belt. Boom, Mike. When you uh, look at it, it's like, at first I didn't really look, but then I looked at it because it's like, you know how sometimes Stephen wears like that, you know, his like little baseball cap and yeah, it's like, it's like almost like it could be his curly hair, could be like a little bit of his facial hair coming out from behind his mask, you know, sound guy. He just hasn't told us. He landed this gig Steven. months ago. What Damn haven't Steven. you told us? What are you holding Steven. out on? <laughs> Steven, you can't. Um, but, I mean, this shot, well, the first thing it screams is Isla Sauna. And while it, I don't think this is Isla Sauna, like, that's the vibe they were going for. No, no, let's no just assume doubt. It is. No doubt. Let's just go ahead and assume that it is. <laughs> I'm fine with that. What, what I love is it's even, like, a little bit more ancient looking than, like, when we saw... Uh, I don't think it's Isla Sorna, but like it, it's stylistically very similar. But like it, it's got even like this more ancient look with the moss and the overgrown trees and the sort of fallen foliage. Uh, where Sorna was like a lot of like similar, but it wasn't quite as old and had a lot more full, big redwoods. Well, and we could see. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if what sort of maybe unnoticed CGI enhancements are added to the to the backgrounds, if anything, as well. This. This definitely has, yeah, I think this has, like, that Sorna vibe, but, like, they went out of their way uh, stylistically with the prop sets to fake this, essentially. Well, because of, um, we, we don't post a lot of these things, but because of, um, leaked set pictures that we are seeing appearing from the set, we know, like, a lot of these trees are absolutely fake, but they built them inside of a real forest, and then on mm -hmm. top of that, they took, like, these very dramatic-looking branches and, like, attached them to real trees that are a little more boring looking and then covered in moss. It did a really good job of transforming a real yeah. forest that was yeah. kind of plain looking into can, something that's just gorgeous. You can see as well in the background, just if you look at where the uh, microphone is to the right of that, you can see the mm -hmm. British boring forest behind the trees. And then you can see the, this is obviously the set that they've built. Um, but if you look, if you zoom right in on the monitor, you can see the actual shot. And it's pretty close, pretty tight, mm. tight behind Chris Pratt. And um, yeah, I mean yeah. the whole thing yeah. just looks. I'm that reminds it really pumped it me. It really up, reminds man. me of the shots of Fallen from Fallen Kingdom of just the way Owen walked through the woods and the way those shots were shot of leading up to Blue's discovery. Yeah, that kind of stockiness, like like the. Po Are you talking about specifically like the like his pose and the way that he's moving? It's like he forest. has dramatic walking down yeah. to like a T. Like every part of his body is like carefully placed for like drama it's like of walking. Three foot three, yeah, like three yard lunges that he's like he kind of makes like he doesn't necessarily bend his legs. He just is kind of like an army little it army. Reads person. so well on camera, like especially. Yeah, he um. The costumes as well look great. I mean, 
it's, it's I guess Owen never changes his clothes. <laughs> He's just in the same Henley and jeans. Yeah. Now he has a glove. What's up with that glove? <laughs> Looks like a little, almost like a golfing glove. You know. Do you think I... he was golfing? Maybe. It could be trying to scope out for a new course, but I actually thought um, I thought it was uh, oh my gosh, I'm having Z Z uh, Z yeah, I thought Zia it was Zia Rodriguez, for, but because I mean, for a pilot, not that pilots don't know how to dress stylist, stylist or be a damn, I can't talk. Uh, uh, the early morning. The, yeah, it's that. It's that. But God, you guys. Pacific Coast uh, <laughs> yeah. 7 p.m. wake up call. Um, her style. I love her style. Okay. That's what I love. And <laughs> everything about her jacket and her whatever kind of. She like... looks like, and I mean this in the best possible way, she looks like she, she, she could be a character out of a Brendan Fraser mummy movie. Yes. I get mm. that. I mean that in the best possible way. She looks pure adventure. It's, yeah, it's exactly. fun. I think it's good, and I'm glad that this wasn't just a shot of the two leads that we we expect. I'm glad that we're seeing a character that we don't know yet as well. Um, I just love the shot. It's so clearly sauna inspired. Um, again, I don't think it's going to be sauna, but no. But I, I definitely feel that there is an aesthetic here that is paying homage to basically something that we all loved in the Lost World but haven't seen stylistically or visually um, again. And I'm sure it'll have its own flavor, but I definitely feel a sense of welcoming from this. But also, maybe it's because I was just exploring forests that look similar, and I enjoy forests like this. Chris, see, again, Chris is out in the woods a lot, and so we know that Chris is just half of the time looking around like Chris Pratt is and just staring <laughs> at the trees. Chris is, um, <laughs> Chris is actually going out there. Practicing the wide walk, practicing that exactly, exactly. long oh, stride. I mean, they're they're going to need a star. They're going to need a movie star after Jurassic World three. You know, <laughs> it's, just got just got to work on it. I believe. Um, let's. Well, can we talk about what we think is happening in this scene? If we think it's, where do we think this is actually taking place? And then where do we, what do we think is happening? I have an, I have some ideas, but well, body language wise. Her character almost seems like she's hopeful or entranced by what she's walking towards, where Owen seems like he's like, I don't think this is a good idea. Yeah, And what like, a gentleman um, having her go first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you go first into the dinosaur zone. I'll sure, follow sure, from sure. behind. Yeah, I'll just be back here, mm. and you, 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 you go ahead. She just seems more comfortable than he does, if and that makes sense. That. Um, I feel like he's taking advantage. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I don't know. It's an interesting shot, Jack. Like, so, like, wh where do you think this is going? Um, I don't. I honestly have no idea. I mean, if it was either sauna, I would. I'd be thinking they were in there trying to hunt something. But then at the same time, or trying to find something. But at the same time, they don't have anything with them that would indicate that that's what they're doing. So either they're lost yeah. or they're. If she's a pilot, maybe they've crash landed. They're heading into somewhere, but I don't think so because that doesn't mm -hmm. align with the set pictures, or sorry, the sets that we saw at Pinewood. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. You mean like where it's just forest without anything really dramatic and indicating no, that there no, was? No, I mean the one with the plane. Oh, there. oh, I know what you're talking. I know what you're talking. You know about. what I'm talking about. Um, also, sorry, I have to just point out the picture. These pictures were uploaded, and we uploaded them without changing the name of them. And it's titled Virus-Hollywood-1-Superjumbo. So, mm. I don't know if that's an indication. This could be some sort of Super Jumbo scene. Um, um, I think Super Jumbo was the size, the way that uh, New, York, New York Times uh, <laughs> like categorizes their photo What's size with, variants. Like, large. <laughs> Super Jumbo. Super Jumbo. Super Jumbo. <laughs> Let's use that from now on. Um, get yourself a super jumbo mask or a um... <laughs> yeah no it's um, I have absolutely no idea Ryan what do you think they're doing okay <clears throat> okay okay it's prepared <laughs> scene California okay remote can only land by helicopter because of the terrain we know blue is probably somewhere located in the 
Californian uh, forests. Yep. And um, I think that's probably maybe what we're looking for here. I don't know why, like, you know, blue was such a, like, predominant part of Fallen Kingdom. Like, you know, there was there was a reason for finding her. I don't know what the reason would be for blue to come back, but... Um, toys. Toys would be probably number one. Um, Story-wise, I don't know how... <laughs> I don't know how... I don't know, but... Uh, you think they're I, looking I, for blue? Yeah, I have, I have kind of... I've kind of pieced some together i think we've all pieced together like what we think our our version of dominion is going to be but um yeah i don't know you know maybe she's maybe she's the farmers i could uh, i almost see it like kind of like wolves because i live you know living in the pacific west coast we have the wolves and since they've been brought back in the past 20 years um there is a, a a push from farmers hunters in regards to how they affect cattle um and uh, I mean, they can they can really do some damage to um, people's livestock, and so I can kind of see. But blue being one creature, I don't know, but I can see there being some sort of reason for like maybe she's being hunted or like, um, so for protection wise. But I don't know. I feel like Owen's looking for his baby. Yeah, no, you could be right actually. And <clears throat> that thing that Colin said a few years ago, maybe it was a year or two ago, about there will be stretches of forest in America. Like imagine a world where you wouldn't be able to enter this forest because there's velociraptors in there or there's something in there. Maybe this mm-hmm. is what this is. Maybe that raptor is blue and there's a stretch of California where people are now unable to go. Maybe this is in a national park. Maybe this is just some section and they know blue's in there and it's kind of resorted to, okay, fine, Owen has to go get her. It could be that. Um, mm-hmm. Personally, hope that it isn't that. Primarily because, um, I mean, going to hunt blue again, like they did it in Fallen Kingdom, and it was kind of a letdown in in the way they did that sequence with the jeep and things like that. I hope this isn't just them going to find blue. But it, I don't. My only thing is like, what what other purpose does does Owen have towards dinosaurs other than blue? Because he doesn't, he's not a dinosaur expert. He's a raptor expert. What? Okay. And his relationship is is tied significantly with Blue. So it's like I, it's like I don't know. I feel like they're all their their relationship is symbiotic throughout the franchise. So like his whole purpose and reasoning for things is like, you know, there's Claire, there's dinosaurs, but it's like the underlying reason is like has always been has been Blue in the first two movies. So like I, I do think, that. though, I do think that we're probably selling, although the films have never done a ter- terrific job of, like, showing this, I'm probably sell- selling him a bit short of, like, what he can offer in the field of dinosaurs. Um, but we just don't know. But he, I could see him being a point of, um, you know, an important person in terms of understanding these animals as they relate to our world. I could see that being a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or it just could be Isla Sorna. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're she, just, they're just uh, like, they're going there, like, let's see what all the fuss is about. Yeah, the fans have told us cool. that we want to go back to Sorna, <laughs> so we're going. Very, very meta. Um, yeah, I don't know. It could be Sorna. I mean, the first first thing when you look at it, you definitely think Lost World, you definitely think Sorna. Um, again, I don't think it is, but that would be cool. I. But the problem is, is that the official universe has now decided that sauna's empty and gone and there's nothing there since like 2003 so there is no real reason to return to sauna unless that's where they're going to take all of the dinosaurs they're able to round up i feel like if it's not specifically explained though within the movies within the films themselves that can all be retconned yeah, I mean, because that's also just the concept of the unreliable narrator. And when the narrator in this case is coming from like an official corporate website, I think that that's as, unreli- as re- unreliable as it can get. And also, InGen might be misrepresenting misrep- facts, or whichever government um, maybe lays a stake on that island might be ris- misrepresenting facts. So I think there's a lot of ways you can say Isla Sorna might still be in play. Well, good, yeah, and... because I never liked that. They just, you know. 
took his yeah. Sora away. It's like, well, no. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd that, be nice to I, think I, that that was a sanctuary and they were able to just they're still there to this day. All of I our mean, yeah. favorite dinosaurs having a grand old time. I mean, that is sort of like the end of the Lost World. I mean, it's not that things can't happen there, but at the same mm-hmm. time, I definitely don't like the idea. It would be like if we found out Isla Nublar erupted and didn't even get like a movie that like even focused on it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. by the way, Isla Nublar. Like, it's just unsatisfying. Yeah. Show it, but also if it doesn't need to be pillaged and decimated and destroyed, then why not just leave it in play? That's that's that whole thing, isn't it? There's only a one deleted scene in the Lost World that says that New Blood was actually destroyed, or like you know they took the assets mm-hmm. out, they destroyed the buildings. That's a deleted scene. As far as I'm concerned, it's not canon. So as far as I'm concerned, and as we kind of see in Jurassic World and in a, a little bit in Fallen Kingdom, the original stuff from New Blood, the original park, was all just left. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, which is awesome, you know, <laughs> that's what when I they want. say that. When they say they destroyed the park, I mean, if you wanted that scene to be canon, it's super easy to keep it canon. They took the assets off of Nublar that they didn't want on there, and they destroyed the park, as in they destroyed their part, their computers and everything, anything that could be like compromised information. They yeah. took the key stuff out of there, and then they let it left rest up, and you know, it costs exactly. a lot of they, money to like firebomb an island or something. I don't see them doing that. So they took what no. they needed, and they uh, got the hell out of there and left it, let it be. Yeah. And then not long after that, the other island got wiped out by a hurricane. Mm-hmm. Um, which the is only thing is, is so, so cool. with like, okay, my brain's going a little ape shit right now. I apologize, it's, but it's the early with, morning. It's fine. It is the yeah, that early morning. <laughs> oh, getting my words back. Um, okay, so we know with the photo, and I know you guys dissected this, but like with the photo flashback to Sorna. Why would we, other than for fan service, get a flash, just a flashback scene, which I'm not arguing. I, I feel like that probably is in some regard. Um, I feel like Sorna's going to come back, though, in a modern, like, like we're going to go back in some way. Because why show it? Why show the flashback? Um, if it's just going to be a scene that, like, you know, it's quick, whatever, and we just happen, and, and we're just seeing, and it is just like the, essentially the sign where it actually doesn't make any relevance in the film. Like, we just see it as as Sorna on the box. That could all play into effect as well. Like, it could have a very small, insignificant role. But for for Colin to tease that specifically, for him to send that out, like, you know, Sorna has got to play a picture in Dominion, boys. And I'm not saying this because I want it. I'm telling you because it's going to happen. So, (laughs) no, hang on, hang on. I get that. But you've got to remember, Colin also teased the East Dock sign, and that never but made it go. But I think now, in terms of scale, you know, that's not, you not, that's not you the better same. better not mess with us with this kind of shit, man. Because <laughs> he's, and I hope he's, I hope, yeah, God, nothing would make me happier if he actually like has the time to listen to our podcast at night. But he has to listen, <laughs> like, and he's just sitting back on a little drink in his chair, laughing like, <laughs> "I've done it again." Then <laughs> these boys uh, all think Sauna's coming back, and it's not. <laughs> yes, shame on me. Shame on me, but um, like, no. Sorna so, is, Sorna is a big, Sorna's a big deal for some people. It is. Okay? I mean, so, it was, a, it was two, two of the three original trilogy was Saturn Sauna, and regardless of JP three, like it's, it is an important island. It's about the lore and history of Jurassic Park and the company behind them. I, I think there has to be a real resolution in Dominion, or it will feel unanswered. Still, well, even if it's just a, a line of dialogue that says, "Oh, it could go here." Uh, well, Jack. Well, so Chris. with that with that image, yeah. There's so there's like two things I think you guys keep calling it a flashback because the image is clearly from like you know the 90s and it's clean and it's not like disturbed so it hasn't been aged and I agree that it's set in that time period, but like it doesn't necessarily mean the scene's a flashback. I mean they could maybe need a in universe photo photo or video inside of like a lab or something set in that time. And that just might be the set decked up to take one photo, and that photo will be like on in like a folder or something like is La Sorna question mark. That mm. said, uh, Ryan, I agree with you. Whether or not that that scene is significant or not, uh, whether or not it's a flashback or it's just like like I said, like a Polaroid that they're going to take in that uh, setting, um, I agree that Colin teasing is La Sorna means that he has something that he has planned for it that. Uh, at the very least, won't leave fans feeling burnt. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going there, but I think that at the very least, we're going to get some sort of answers with Sorna and a little bit of something. Um, 
a little bit of more of just it being on the side of a crate. I yeah, I assume because yeah. he knows the way yeah. this this fandom can be. And yeah, I, I think he knows that, especially after Fallen Kingdom as well, that Sauna needs there needs to be some form of resolution. There needs to be uh, a question and an answer to it because you know even Fallen Kingdom, the most lo- I know that the the idea was always the auction. They wanted those dinosaurs in California. But it was so confusing when Lockwood was like, we're taking them to this sanctuary. It's like, why not just dump them on Sauna, for goodness sake? Like, that's the most logical thing. It's close. It's an island. They own it. I don't know. Yeah. No. So It always seemed so strange that Sorna wasn't where they brought it. And if they went to the Sanctuary Island or if the sanctu- Sanctuary Island was important in some way, I could understand it. I just think that it was one of those things that when it was shown in fallen kingdom and they were like we have this sanctuary island to me they were lying lockwood was lying whether it was a sanctuary or not i believe that that was never an island by itself it looked like a section of an island um like an island chain or something like that no like um you know how I, i can't remember exactly but looking at the the like 3d printed map thing that they had of it it looked like it had the front part of an island and then it was like a mountain range, right? And and the the actual model finished there, but yeah. it just looked like it was part of land, like it connected to land. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like it was a section of of somewhere in America, South America, or something like that. And they just they would have it sectioned off so the dinosaurs could live there. But to me, that was always just a ploy to get Claire. Well, Lockwood, though, I mean, he. I guess it depends on how far back the deception with Mills went. Yeah, I also um, yeah I don't, I don't know how much um, we can trust real Lockwood either. I mean he, yeah he was this old man who seemed bumbling and sweet, but at the end of the well, day I mean, he we split literally, from John Hammond back in the day. But I mean Mills you know. literally murders him because he discovers his ploy. <laughs> so I mean at yeah, the very where did, least we know that Mills Lockwood learned that from. Where did Mills? We know that from? Lockwood wasn't in on it, and Lockwood thought that he was bringing them to a sanctuary island. Whether or not that sanctuary island existed or existed, not, yeah, he definitely yeah. believed it. He did not have Mills. Some, you know, <sighs> your deception runs deep, you son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, and as for Mills. Yeah, I, I I still wish that, that we would have skipped over the murder because he was kind of he was le- he felt so complex when he was staring at the map after like they said they got the dinosaurs he seemed so tormented by his actions yeah. and I thought that we would have seen his torment they, destroy him rather than him just murder an old man with a pillow and uh, <laughs> then get eaten by some dinosaurs yeah the first proper yeah. human on human murder mm-hmm. in the Jurassic franchise and it was with a pillow to an old man. <laughs> <laughs> Very Jurassic, um, uh, <laughs> but I think they, they yeah they really uh, wasted the opportunity with Rafe Spall. He is such a dynamic actor, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, we were really excited for him to be in it. And do you remember all the training videos where he was getting beefed up? Yeah, wait, why was he getting so yeah. beefed up? Why uh, he was going to be in a suit the whole time? Everybody looks good in a suit. I I wonder if he was going to be on the island at some point or something. I don't know, but that doesn't really make sense. But maybe the character evolved. You know, I think it's I think it's interesting though that I mean it's not out of the realm of Crichton's universe at least to be murderous because the Dotson that we know mm-hmm. it you know was had all intentional purposes to murder Sarah uh, unsuccessfully and and so like that's what I'm interested to see in Dominion like what kind of Dotson are we going to see older wiser but like murderous possibly well, like see. My thing is, is I would have been all on board for that, but now that we've had so many murder, mustache twirling, twirling murderous uh, villains here, um, Ooh, led by Dr. I would, Wu, the king I would villain. rather have more of a kind of complex, you know, whereas in like Ludlow wasn't murdering anybody, uh, you know, he still they still all tried to save people's lives. He was a slime ball, but like he wasn't a murderer or anything along those lines. Same with Nedry, he that wasn't his intent. I think I'd rather get back to a villain like that, something that's more realistic, realistic in terms of how often you run into those types of villains in their lives and uh, mm-hmm. just hu- much more human nature type of villain rather than somebody completely gone and murdering yeah for murder. sure yeah i think the dodgson thing is going to be interesting cause i don't think we're going to see him in it too much as in <clears throat> you know in the wild i think he's very much going to be a corporate ceo you know behind the desk calling the shots um sure 
Which is a shame because the Dodgson in Lost World is dope. Is a great yeah, character. Yeah, no, I mean, he, the same... he meets his demise and it's perfect. Like, it's so well executed. And you just. At the same time, if they did that with, like, Ellie or something like that, that would be so cool. Ellie? No. Whoa, what? No, See, like, this... if they. Because if, like, Dodson tries to kill Sarah in the Lost oh, World. Oh, you mean tries to oh. kill, so, like, push take Ellie Sarah out? Yeah. And it's Ellie, and then, El- like, we get that same sort of scene played out, but with, uh, you know, Ellie and Dodson rather than, obviously, Ooh. Sarah and Dodson. Like a, sh- like a freezing water ship overboard scene? Yeah. When they're heading uh. to Sanctuary number three. <laughs> hey, so, <laughs> well, yeah, um, but, yeah. I've seen a lot of Sona. posts about people almost hoping that there's a character death in this. I don't understand. Like, I don't understand why so many people want one of the main characters to die. Like, firstly, people are like, well, it'd be great if, like, Chris Pratt might die or something like that. But then there's people that are like, it would be so horrible and great if Sam, you know, Alan Grant dies at the end. I'm just like, I don't get I, it. It's not that kind no, of franchise. No, Jurassic <laughs> isn't the type of franchise to kill off its legacy characters. Um, I don't, I don't know think why Claire there's such or a demand Owen or anybody for it. should die even there, but um, or especially not Grant or whatnot. I think that there part of that is coming from the fact that the films like Who Lives and Who Dies has felt a little bit more predictable, um, and now that we have so many returning characters, you can kind of just sort of hedge your bets that they're all going to survive, and I kind of agree that they should at this point. However, I think yeah. that what people want is maybe introducing new characters that you think are there for the ride, you think they're untouchable, and then they go out like Eddie, um, you know, or something along those lines. Like, you think that they're one of those characters that are, yeah. you know, guaranteed survival in a Jurassic film, and then, oh, no, they they got eaten. And I guess that maybe that's sort of where that where that demand is coming from is somebody that wants that kind of feeling recaptured where they just don't know who's going to make it who might meet their demise. No, I understand that, but that, that doesn't seem to be where this is coming from. It seems to be more just fan accounts that want to see, like, oh, wouldn't it be so tearful and awesome if, like, Alan Grant died? And it's just like, for what reason? No, though? no, it no, wouldn't do not be. kill. It would be ridiculous. <laughs> no, and there's also death. no reason for it. Out of, if he survived this long with dinosaurs in the world, I think a paleontologist, he's going to survive again. Yeah. And I also, like, I don't understand where it's coming from. Like, it's well, it's coming from, like, a Marvel Universe thing. You know, like, oh, it's like time to say goodbye to this character. It's like, you can say goodbye to Dr. Grant and not kill him. Yeah, he can live a quiet life. Like, he's <laughs> yeah, all, he, in a tree on no his matter, Yeah, no. And plus, and I've said this, I think in the, it was in the last podcast we had, about how death is so much more final. Uh, it's real and brutal in Jurassic Park. It's not like Star Wars where there's an afterlife or Marvel where there's an afterlife or whatnot, where the blow is softened. Even if they never come back, the blow is softened because we know the death isn't the end. But like in Jurassic Park, I mean, it's brutal. You get torn apart by dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, yeah. and that's th- that's and that. That's that. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it's kind of fucking horrific. So I wouldn't want to see Grant or even Owen or anybody go out like that. Like, it's just, it's a bit rough. Um, once you spent enough time with them in this universe, just, yeah, they should kind of be untouchable. Um, yeah, although I wouldn't be opposed, um, to Wu? To, to any of, I mean, Dr. Wu should have died in Fallen Kingdom, maybe, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't take one of the one of the world Jurassic World characters dying if it was an earned and honorable death or something like that. Uh, I just it's just so unnecessary. Like Chris Pratt and Claire dying. Like why? Why? Yeah. Owen and Claire. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I don't get that. I I think that getting a character death in this movie is probably important, but it'll most likely come from one of the new characters. Uh, well, maybe you know what would be interesting if. They really do have this relationship between Barry and Owen that they were supposed to have in this trilogy. If they really bring that home in this one, maybe either Owen or Barry will... It will be like a sacrificial death to survive the other one. But they've got that friendship, so it's a true, like, emotional scene, you know? Yeah. Like, kind of like when Eddie died, and it was they were like, well, we've just spent loads of time with Eddie. He saved us. Like, that's that's horrible. Yeah. It may be that. It's something they're going to draw on. But I don't know. There's, I have no idea. I, I, there's a lot of characters in the movie. Yeah, that's too many. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, um, let's talk about that other picture. So they released the... That what one. other picture? There's another picture, Chris. What other this picture? One, this one isn't super jumbo. This is just New York Times. I renamed this one. Damn it. Well, what size was it? 
It was super jumbo. Really? Because it was smaller yeah. than the other one. You sure it was jumbo? Uh, I definitely saved the super jumbo. I don't know if I uploaded the right one now that you say that. No, no, no. The one on the New York Times wasn't this big. But anyway, <laughs> so we're now talking about the no, 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 no. If you type in super jumbo, if you type in super jumbo, though, if you change the image name, you will get the larger one. Oh, okay. on New York Times. Excellent. I did not know that. So that's the key, super jumbo. Um, so super this jumbo. is um, this is a bunch of compies in a container. Um, and aren't they glorious? They are. They look so basically look just like the Chronicle Compi. Which is funny because the Chronicle Compi is based off of a Stan Winston maquette, uh, I believe that Tim Gore painted. And in the maquette, the Compi has red eyes and like red around the eyes. Where in the final film, the animatronics uh, for went the uh, they got rid of the red eyes and went for a brown eye with just like a hint of like ember red in there so there is a hint of red in their brown eyes they're not like pure brown but they're mostly dark and muted and then it looks like in dominion they went full on into the red eyes and made them red glass eyes which is yeah. really striking looking they're evil little savages and um, yeah i like so the red eyes compies are something that have only been in sort of the background since the lost world they were in jp3 but they just sort of are there and then they run uh but it's great that they're going to be in some sort of sequence here, and there's at least five puppets there. Yeah, that all look great. Um, it looks like their snout, their lips. Like it looks like they're actually going to be able to like snarl or whatnot. Yeah, you see yeah. what I mean? How like the lips yeah. look very malleable. Yeah, I know what you mean. Showing the little razor blade teeth down there as well. These are little fuckers, man. These are great. They so that's sort of what changed for sure is the teeth are different. They are larger this time around. There are more teeth and they are larger, and it gives them this sort of rabid, ravenous animal look. Um, yeah, that's so, definitely one of so the, things the scene in the Lost World with Dita, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everybody questions like, why, why didn't he just keep running? Like he, you know, he, he, yeah, he'd fallen and he was probably out of energy because they'd been hiking for what two days in, in on mm -hmm. sauna or a day and a half. Um, but why didn't he just keep going when the adrenaline and he was there? But in the novels, the the bites from the compies are po like poisonous, right? They have the saliva. Right. Yeah, like... the compies are venomous. Venomous, and... yeah they i forget what exactly they described it as but it's not like it would Neurotop. kill you yeah it like it slows you down it makes you super sluggish to the point where like you eventually like slip Pass into out. a temporary coma or something yeah so with dita you can kind of see that happening he gets to a point where yeah he's being bitten and all over but then he basically just like throws his own body like crawls over the log and then he can't even stand back up and they've already jumped him um so... i always assumed that he was yeah, that they were that they were venomous. Yeah, I yeah. think that's like the most logical thing. And I, I, I mean, think it's that's not what's... explained in the movies, yeah. so I can't. If you've never read the books or whatnot, I don't blame people for like that. People going like, "What?" Mm -hmm. But it, it definitely seems like that was the intent while writing the scene, and just the information never got passed to the viewer. Yeah, and also, you know, if you think about, they bred the same company as the ones that bred the Dilophosaurus that had venomous spray. So it's not like mm -hmm. something that would feel weird it would make a lot of sense if they were mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah i just love that about them and these ones look like they could do the same kind of damage they've got these horrible razor blade teeth they've got like red glowing eyes they just piranhas. look like evil little bastards and um like piranhas funny if that's what they were actually like kind of like uh if they had partial dna infusion piranha infusion <laughs> yeah. like, i don't know why you would make such a vicious little creature but i I think it was the a cease that immediately pointed out they look more piranha like uh, this they time do. around. Yeah, they are. I mean, they're and in the books as well, and and in science, I think they're kind of described as scavengers. So it's like they don't look like scavengers though. In in these pictures, they look like I don't know. I don't know. But at the same time, like having having him little murder having monsters. them be in a cage. Here's the thing. Here's my here's my only issue with the picture. Well, and, I, and I told you that like the designs of them kind of throw me off a little because they are different. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about how they're different? Because we so, talked about the teeth and the eyes. Well, I sent I sent a picture to the guys uh, yesterday just talking about this because I'm like, oh, you know, the, the designs they're different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, because this is is this Scanlon's? 
Correct this me. is no, it is John Nolan's team. Oh, that's okay. Um, the dinosaurs, like, don't get me wrong, like, they, they look JP, but like, there is a difference to them, and so I've always uh, incorporated that with uh, everything that we pretty much saw, especially in '93, was infused with frog DNA, right? And the compies really emphasized that in the Lost World. And I think Stan took that into some or into a, in a lot of effect when you look at the combis because their skin has frog like um, texture and, and it's very amphibian like it's very I mean the colorized you know the coloring on them is like uh, very amphibian like it's just yeah it's like an amphibian and amphibian and I always thought it was kind of cool the way that they could jump um, having them kind of be like you know like could you imagine having compies be on the dish like comp, having compie legs um like as an like a French um, cuisine instead of frog. <laughs> so yeah. it's like like I mean when you just look at it like in the way that they jumped and everything I'm like man these things have like frog legs even and I always saw that as a kid. So but anyway these ones they have there's a difference to them in the design and so um, that could just be um, you know an update from the creative team. But I like to think of it as ooh, are these more leaning towards like especially in Jurassic Park 3 where the dinosaur is leaning towards a more um, fully genomed if you will dinosaur that you know if, with, with each, each generation that was born um, having their DNA basically become more and more infused to, to ultimately create and have there be um, an accurate version of what dinosaurs used to be and we saw that with the quills and stuff so um I always kind of maybe imagine that this is like why that's happening or it could be like, yeah, some crazy ass fucker infused these guys with piranhas and just, <laughs> just went home laughing about it. But well, I think um, it's an interesting theory. They definitely look different, but I don't know whether that's just supposed to be or just because it's a different company making them and they did the best they could trying to replicate the, the ones we see in the lost world. I have a strong feeling that it's more so that, but also we have no idea when these were bred, where they're from. Like, are they rescues from sauna? Like, are they leftovers or are they like a new company? They could be made... biosins. They could yeah. be biosins, yeah. Um, but I think what's interesting, somebody else pointed this out. See in the background of the shot, you see quite a Malta-esque aesthetic there. You see the archway mm. in the back of the shot. Somebody compared mm. it to just like a generic shot from Malta and it looks strikingly similar in architecture oh very very good point it makes me think that then this might be like a black market yeah and that kind of fits with the cage and you know what we're seeing uh i i think that's a strong possibility that the, these are these are being sold in malta or you know a location where they're using malta for um i don't know i mean and now now, yeah, thinking about it, like why, why, especially if if there's a higher value to a dinosaur that's got a purpose, or, um, you know, like what what could compies do besides like maybe clean up some dead animals? But if you also, you know, if they could infiltrate, if you could give them some sort of capability, but it added like a ferociousness to them, uh, all of a sudden their market value could go up for people who want them for, like swarming. It, it, yeah. Exactly. Like you know, you send in the con send in the copy, and it's like <laughs> they, they you know they track down. They got little cameras on their head or whatever. They get into little tight places under doors, go, get through ventilation systems to find the terrorists or yeah, those. But an interesting cage too, because as I also pointed out, I feel like these guys could just easily squeeze through those bars. Yeah, the the positioning <laughs> of that first one we see the closest oh. to the actual camera. I don't think. Um... <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a little bit too much out the cage, isn't it? They're they're slender these compies. They aren't they aren't fat boys. <laughs> no, I mean I mean yeah, their bellies could be a little wide, their guts could be a little wide, but uh, it does there's... look like they could just slip through. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's but it also comes across as and I don't think it's like cheesy in that effect, but it does come across as something that you would just see at Universal if you were just walking down the hallway waiting for the line to get into the ride. Yeah, and this is just like kind of attached to the wall and chirp, chirp, chirp. These little animatronics are, but I that's love kind the of, look of it. That's the kind of I can imagine this scene. The way it takes place would be somebody's in this black market, whether it's our main characters or whether it's and they're just looking around, 
they get a little bit too close to this cage without realizing, you know, with their back to it. And they start getting gnawed by these things that are like sticking their heads through. And that's the kind of realization that makes them jump, you know, something like that, I think mm -hmm. could be realistic. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a really cool shot though. And just seeing the compies again is something that I really, um, I'm really excited about. Like they, the, like I said, they were in Fallen Kingdom. They were in, they were, were they in Jurassic World? Were they compies in Jurassic World? There was just little hints of them hopping around, I think, in both. Yeah, but we never saw them properly. They never got their time of day. They never got their scene. I think um, I think this is, this photo might be telling us that they are in, they're they not just going to be there in that cage and that's it. There's going to be some form of compi, compi scene, right? There's going to be, a, there's got to be a sequence with these bastards. I don't know. I mean, like with the Star Wars you know, there was there was so much pointed out about the animatronics and the focus on that that they were that they were using and 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 while I well, don't get me wrong, like with the Force Awakens, I loved how that looked. Uh, so, Ryan, I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, and well, Jack, I'm kind of curious. Like, are these remember when we saw the first Fallen Kingdom trailer, the teaser of uh, Owen running and the stampede starting, and the uh, the compies <laughs> yeah. jumping out, and we were just like, it's so. Yeah big it's the giant so mega big, compies. It was like the big, super jumbo the compies. mega compi the mega yeah. comp, super jumbo <laughs> um super <but> are <laughs> are these different <laughs> designs than the um like are they bigger are they thicker or are we seeing the winston design I... wrapped like turned into a latex skin and then slightly changed to fit like the new functions of the animatronics I, see, I think it's down that route. I said to Ryan just before, I think that this is just trying to replicate what the compies were um, to get the exact look. But obviously it's a different company. Like you said, it's different puppetry, so they probably don't look the same. But I can tell you, I have the Chronicle compie. And, mm -hmm. and the way her hand is, is resting on the head uh, and things like that, like the proportions, it looks Are... dead on the same size. And obviously you can't tell the real comparison, but like mm -hmm. I often grab the compi by the head like that. Well, and, we... <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, it looks the same. And I genuinely well, we know think these that... are just trying to go down the same route. Exactly. Well, we know the, the production got the Stan Winston original compi from Chronicle for Fallen Kingdom and scanned it and uh, molded it so that their CG compies could be the same. So I'm assuming this is built from that, and I think that what ended, up, what ended up changing here is just whatever the rig needs to do. Some of that might have needed new like like puppetry holds and whatnot. So I think like the lips might be extended out a little bit more, um, just because they might be more flexible this time around. Um, and then otherwise, some of the eyes like they're like the eyelids aren't closing a little bit, so it just makes the eyes look bigger with the really light red eyes. I think that they just stand out more. I think the only real change that we're seeing is the teeth. The teeth is kind of a big mm -hmm. change, and it they're, really does kind of change the feel of them. They got, they've got, got there's a there's a girthiness to the neck. Uh, if <laughs> yeah. anything, they're they're if you look at their jaws and like the width and 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 uh, I guess pronounced chiselness of it there's that they have much slimmer jaws in the previous designs so that what that's what makes their heads kind of have this more triangle cone mm -hmm. shape um but the larger eyes definitely like if you look at their sockets just in general takes up a huge portion but it's also kind of cool because there's such there's a cool mold around it like if you just kind of pay attention to the shadows it, like there's a skeleton design underneath that skin that yeah. looks it looks dynasty. real the yeah, eyes are definitely huge, but it doesn't are look they out bigger? place because of the, the the whole head shape. You, you, Jack, like you are said, they the... bigger though than your maquette, oh. or or is it just the fact that they are so big initially, and because they're way lighter and standing out a lot more? I mean, this girl they's... could just be like a you know the size of a small child as well. She, <laughs> yeah. Well, she I'm the size of a small child though. So I, well, I mean, could... no, I just mean the eye, the eye, the eye size to the skull socket. Is it bigger? Oh, for sure. In this yeah, than the maquette. Like at least. 20% larger. Is it, Jack? I mean, you have the maquette. Is yeah, it I'm larger? not looking at it right now. Oh. Um, if I turn my head, I'll see it, but I'm not going to do that for you. Um, I'll, I'm going to pull up a picture. No, I mean, <laughs> the one that not, she's touching definitely has 
It's definitely a larger eye. I mean, it but could be a larger eye, but I do think that they're just looking larger as well just because of the striking eye color change. What I will say is, especially the ones in the background that are slightly out of focus, it really makes me feel like the Jurassic Park the game Trodon could uh, work mm. with, like, eyes like... Like, I don't know, even though... There's something about it that gives me that feeling of the JP the game Trodons, even though they don't really look like it. It's like they're capturing that vibe. It would be cool to, like... I mean, because you talk about... What are the little... We're, uh, mm, the little bush monkeys that like fit in your palm, your hand, but they've got the big eyes and like the, oh, yeah, yeah. the orange red tint, but that's because they, for their nocturnal vision essentially. So that would be kind of cool if it was talked about for um, infiltrating at night. Yeah. I don't know. They're really, really cool looking. Um, but yeah, there, there are differences. The teeth are probably the one thing that bothered me because the rest of the differences are fairly minor and could probably be chalked up to puppet, like puppeting rigs. Yeah, yeah this I, I, I think. Complete... So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I think that's a. I think it's. I think genuinely they are trying to be the same compi, and it's just a case of maybe, like as Chris was saying, the, well, the way the puppets now work or something that it's just adapted the shape a little bit. But I have no idea. I think um, it can go both ways. If this is a black market selling these dinosaurs, who bred them? You know what I mean? Mm hmm. It wasn't necessarily in gen, and these aren't necessarily from Sauna. Oh, I mean, these could just be captured out of Lockwood's backyard. Yeah, they could be captured. Yeah, these could be the little fuckers we see in Fallen Kingdoms darting around the place. Or... Yeah, and I'm, I mean, we've talked about this countless times, but I imagine they breed like rabbits. Like, I mean, once you have compies free in the wild, it's probably like all bets are off because these things just get everywhere and breed a lot and multiply a lot. Yeah. The, well, I mean, the question now, because Colin's always teased this, is after the after after the auction, you sell a dinosaur, you hire your own science team, your own genetics team to pull apart your dinosaur's DNA. You know, all of a sudden, you've got the capabilities. Possibly, like, is Biosyn going to be the only one that controls the market at this point? It, what's engines? What's engines still doing at this? You know, yeah. like. Uh, are so there the, are there black market uh, cloning going on? Like, are these like some version that you know? Like, is it open source essentially? Or well, I mean, that's that's something that Colin has said that he wanted this franchise to go to, where other people have the capability to make these animals. And at the end of Fallen Kingdom, that's you know Iron Home, where they are buying the dinosaurs and presumably buying the technology, because we saw like a lot of other things, um, like you know DNA vials were sold straight up. Mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I think that the technology is out there mainstream like if you've got the money to pay for it now you don't have to be like the top top of the line um like engine was like now it's out there the secret's out people are selling it they're trading it they're trading the gear and i think it's out there um but the question is what is engine doing still also like we don't know what state engine is in um, and how independently Engine operated from Jurassic World, the theme park, and Mizrani Global, the parent company. So I, there's a lot of things. Like I think there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, but knowing that so many copies got free in the wild at the end of Fallen Kingdom, that just wouldn't surprise me if that's where these guys are sourced from. Mm -hmm. uh, but, My brain's spinning because I... I, I... Just because we didn't see them pick up compies doesn't mean they didn't grab them, but like... Well, we saw them get we saw them get freed from uh, Lockwoods at the end. Oh, true, true, true. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they were uh, peeking on uh, Mills before uh, the whole Carnotaurus thing and then the mm -hmm. T-Rex, and he just got eaten by so many things. Poor guy. Not really. Rough times. <laughs> Deserved it. Yeah, um, so I mean, it's going to be curious, though, to see what... Um, it's interesting that you know, like, that we think that it's annoying that Colin's dropping this news, but at the same time, it's not. Like, we love this. It, it, I mean, and, and and he even said, like, with in terms of animatronics, like, this is going to be the most within the film that we've ever seen. So, I love. I think that he's just pointing out that, like, even within these small details, because this could just be a walk by shot, right? Like, mm -hmm. these guys are just in the background. Like, oh, this is our little black market area. Like, there could be other dinosaurs within this room that are kept in cages. And these guys are just in there, chirp, chirp. That's all we see. But, like, the attention to detail is there. 
the camera might never go close to these, and that's something that Star Wars does really effectively, is they have these really complex and beautiful-looking, like, animatronic creatures and aliens and whatnot, and they're, you can barely see them. Like, you know, they're, like, way back in the corner of a bar or, like, you know, in a market or in a cage or something like that. And we could be looking at something similar where you have this, you know, hero animatronic quality, but the thing is, is they never, you know, the camera might never favor them that much, and they're just something to bring the world to life without CGI. Like, there's these living, tactile things that are just constantly part of it, and that could be really See, fun. and I love that. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking, this is rewinding a bit, but the Compi's eyes red, I don't even think they're red in Fallen Kingdom or in uh, Battle of Big Rock. They're definitely not red in Jurassic World when the jumbo, the Super Jumbo ones run past they're just like an all color brownie green yeah 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 like brown almost darkish black yeah no exactly so the red eyes is we it's a curious choice because it's not a choice that they made for fallen kingdom so like they brought them back and they tweaked them for this practical design they decided to tweak them and i don't know if that's just something like when it started living in the real tactile world they realized that making the eyes more vibrant actually looked cooler or something Mm -hmm. and they said screw it let's do it um sometimes once you make something into a practical effect and you can really interact with it it's easier to start making changes. For sure. Yeah, I don't know, because I could see them reading really well in the distance also with those red eyes. Yeah, well, I think um, before I mentioned how if this is a black market, we have our characters, whoever we're following, going through it, they might have their back turned to this cage, and then they get a little bite or something, you know, it grabs them, um, and that's the kind of compy reveal. Um but I hope there's a sequence. I hope there's a scene with actual compies. Maybe not a replication of the Dieter Stark death, but I want to see these little fuckers take someone over. Like, I want to see them attack, especially if they swarm and if they breed in ridiculous quantities and just swarm. Like, imagine if we see more stories in Dominion, maybe that's how the movie's set up, where uh, people are in the wild and interacting with dinosaurs without knowing that that was going to happen, you know, like accidental run-ins, maybe mm-hmm. there's like, you know, think about it, like a school trip, walking through a national park, bunch of teachers, you know, a bunch of kids, and all of a sudden there's this swarm of compies. I mean, absolutely brutal, and we won't see it in a Jurassic movie, but, you know, that kind of thing, you know, interactions with these, but like, people getting swarmed by them would be would be dark. Well, what's really cool. interesting is we're, I think, to presume that compies aren't ones to be aggress- that aggressive when there's a r- abundance of food available. Um, and they'll typically only then hunt when something's like isolated from the pack. But then they become very dangerous when they're in large numbers and they have you isolated. But I don't think that they'd be ones to like necessarily hunt all the time. They're probably happy eating bugs and mice and whatnot. But when they happen to be a large pack and there happens to be somebody that seems like they're alone and whatnot i can I see their know. hunting instincts popping in i think that's I like what, what we've seen uh little kirby dude little kirby dude had his wits about him and when he heard those little chirp chirps he got the f out this is true he knew true but he was isolated and alone so like he was prime he was prime meal for them Small. i don't know, but i mean like they had an abundance of food at that point Fair, but I imagine the jungles of uh, Isla Sorna are more competitive than, like, wherever they might be in, like, North America. Mm. Well, At these... least for, for an animal like them, they're not facing any direct competition. Mm. Although they'd probably be eaten by, like, bobcats and, like, hawks a lot. Yeah, so I maybe, mean... they've, maybe they would have adapted to have this more of a savagery to them because they've got to protect themselves as well at all times. They could just be curious little bastards, and like again, it's 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 not talked about, but it would be interesting to know that like everybody except for the the general audience knows that they're poisonous or venomous. So it's not so much of a oh my god they're gonna they're after me. It's like if I get bit by one, like it could be bad. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, that that could be really fun. And I just, I don't know, just something about the shot, it just very feels very Jurassic Park, especially when you zoom in and you just see, like, the grates of the cage. You can almost imagine, like, a grate of a door or something, and they're just trying to push on through, and it's, like, kind of spooky looking. The no, I lighting agree, I agree. And I everything really like, like that. The shot. Those yeah. these two shots, man, they're, they're, they're brilliant behind-the-scenes shots, and, um, you know, I'm really pleased that we have confirmation that they're all wearing masks. That's excellent. That's all I wanted to know. Um, 
but the, yeah the compies <laughs> themselves and like the crate and the decor and you know the malta looking architecture in the background this this whole this whole black market vibe is really there's a lot of grounding for it i think mm -hmm. i think it's quite strong this could be black market this could be back end this you know all this could be in gen trying to set up jurassic park well, malta you know <laughs> well you know like it's funny because this is not the first time we saw a dinosaur in the cage you know the first dinosaur we saw from this movie the baby nasuchoceratops we saw the animatronic rigging uh that's being built around it's like a cage so it's like a interesting yeah so i wonder if that's a similar style cage as well do you know what i mean i like, feel like it would have to be more open because otherwise you just would not see this really beautifully sculpted animal but hey i mean i guess it's more realistic yeah. You noticed how um, I know this is this isn't actually an in-film shot; it's behind the scenes. But you know how the cage fix it's fixes at the top with the clip. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it doesn't have a padlock on it, and those compies can almost get their entire body through the holes. Mm. Like they could push easily that push that and get themselves <laughs> out, like so easily. I wonder if you see how that one how 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 it has its shoulders all the way out, mm -hmm. but it's the one that she's working on. You notice all the other ones really. Oh, never mind. Another one does have its shoulders no, out. No, the third one in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Its shoulders out. I was gonna say like maybe like they're they're supposed to not have their shoulders out, and that one's just out further. Because if their shoulders weren't out, I wouldn't necessarily think they could get through. But yeah, well, again, the back end on the maquette is a, is wider anyway than the front, obviously, like its legs and round the tail area. But I mean, these these have got to be like you, everybody's seen videos of like rats squishing their body up and going under a door yeah. or something, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't put it past a compi to put its body through the limits to to get into a room or something. Maybe they have little mini leg shackles. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a bo with a mi mini boulder on. <laughs> they're, actually, they're actually all just little mini ankle bracelets that they keep to track them. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh man, it's a great yeah. shot though. Um, that, was there anything else referenced in the article then from the New York Times? It was mostly talking about how they're able um, to. The budget is two hundred million. Two hundred million. Uh, that's the highest it's been so far. Uh, yeah. That's not the biggest movies like this tend to be. It's still like surprisingly like well, that's on the high end, but it's surprisingly still for its highest end. It's modest for like what some of these movies have a bad habit of doing and just blowing it up. So that's kind of cool. Um, so if the budget's being spent right, that's good, I guess. It's not modest, man. I mean, shit. I mean, yeah. that when doesn't include the marketing budget, which is probably the same, if not more than that. Like, it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's once you include high. that, once you include that, like, it does get way higher. And the marketing of these films has probably skyrocketed now that they know they have, like, a winner on their hands. Yeah. At um, least we're going to know the answers to all of our questions before the movie comes out. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. It'll First trailer will come out and we'll be like, <laughs> like, oh, characters do die. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so the article did give us a budget, and yeah, that is a high budget, but it's just not like 250 million or like 300, so that some people, uh, some films get. Uh, we know the schedule. They said that yep. at the beginning of September they will be going out to Malta to film for eight days, and then they're back to uh, London, and they will be fi filming around London or at Pinewood Studios. For the remainder of the shoot which i think is into october yeah so there's absolutely nothing confirmed about uh hawaii in fact this pretty much confirms that they are not shooting in hawaii sorry but uh, it doesn't but all... that that means cast and crew uh sorry that means yeah. like you know cast they they very well could be doing second third unit kind of um mm -hmm. you know pickup shots in hawaii landscapes that kind of thing exactly because, for yeah. example if this shot is on sauna the one of chris pratt and um dewanda if that's sauna, then they're obviously going to go to Kauai and get the Nepali coastline and get some shots of sauna. But I don't think it is. I don't think we're going to see sauna. I don't really think we're going to see Nublar again. I think if we do, it'll be in a background news report or it'll be, because they love that, the BBC. Or it'll be, you know, it'll be referenced. But I don't think we're going to see that again. But I think if, if every movie in this franchise so far has had Hawaii, and this is the, you know, the last one with quotation marks... Um, they yeah they may as well have some goddamn hawaii in there i think they kind of or, need to at this point <laughs> maybe yeah, end well, with i'm a, just excited for the new look of this film though because it's familiar it's looking familiar but it's also looking new like that shot of you know the sorna but not sorna that that's a very familiar looking shot that feels jurassic but there is something about that one that looks a little new 
And I, I hope that we really get to – we've talked about this before, but like we haven't really got to candidly explore the wildest or most beautiful landscapes within the world films. Like we kind of get these wide shots. You're like, oh, that's cool. And yeah, it's then, called Jurassic World, but so far we you, haven't actually been out into And the then you world. play in like a very cluttered jungle where nothing really reads visually. Like, you know what I mean? Like we haven't seen like the most striking areas of like – a lot of movies tend to film at like the most striking area, so every shot is crafted. And I don't think Jurassic should necessarily do that, but like there's a middle ground where you can play around with, and I'd like to see that uh, more. And hearing yeah. that we're that they filmed in uh, that that one island out by Egypt, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is, is, is it Sakatora Suc- or Sakatra? Uh, we get it um, wrong every time. I think it's Sakatra. Yeah, Sakatra. Um, that sounds awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know. And just that shot again, there's something about it. it. It looks real, but it's just ever so slightly – the composition even of like the way the forest is around them. It looks nice. Yeah, um, and if you zoom right into the actual uh, camera and you look at the monitor, the preview monitor, mm-hmm. you can see that – I think we discussed this before. You yeah. can see the angle that it's going for, but you can see it looks even more saunery there because you have that deep, like cloudy, foggy, misty atmosphere above yes. it, see what i mean the light yeah. coming through the trees it's exactly. very much sauna inspired wherever it's going to be um and i think that's great that's um as you I said think... it, it kind of fills in that visual jurassic element oh. that, we, that we feel may have been and missing we also know that they're playing in snow in this movie which is pretty nuts like there's going to be a decent presumably a decent amount of snow because we know that there there have been snowy sets in london and they filmed out in the snow quite a bit in uh canada um, so that, that it's going, it's going to have a really unique visual identity because you have this very ancient, almost like coniferous looking forest here in the redwoods. Um, and then you have this, you know, snowy tundra like landscape and then potentially we might have like deserty, yeah. deserty Northern California, almost, maybe wilderness. Hey, almost mummy style. Or, or like, like with the Malta stuff, you know, if you that picture of the compies in the background with the architecture, yeah, that's kind of like the mummy almost because it's going down that kind of sandy. It's got that old school warm. classic adventure film, you know, the yeah. Indiana Jones type of like. It's just that is a really cool visual identity, and I would love to see the dinosaurs also in like the wilds of areas like that, even if it's maybe just like California deserts and badlands and whatnot. Like that'd be fun to play around with the dinosaurs, but we're gonna have a lot of visual identities in this film what i hope is that we get to spend enough time in them where it doesn't feel jumpy or maybe there's a way that this all organically connects to one another that i'm just not figuring right now mm-hmm. like i you mentioned this before jack but you're like i hope it's not like one of the born identity films where you're just like hopping on a plane you're at a new location new location new location <laughs> you never really settle in yeah um and yeah i guess but I'm excited for all the unique visuals that this movie seems to be promising to offer. Although I'm curious how they're doing it because uh, apparently they don't have to film on location very many places. So I'm just curious if they're adapting with plate shots and more set builds. But if the set builds look like this, I'm happy with that. Yeah. I am not entirely – A, first. I'm not entirely convinced that – dinosaurs will necessarily be seen in the snowy shots but that's not to say <clears throat> that some sort of prehistoric animal could not be i almost because every time i've thought of any sort of snowy environment within the jurassic universe and especially like with the with the game um it'd be cool to see at least some sort of play if like Inchin or biasin was out somewhere playing with mammoth well or if you yeah. remember the uh, Maserati Global website, and they mentioned some of their subsidi- subsidiaries, subsidiaries, excuse mm-hmm. me, uh, <laughs> um, they talk about Martel Corp, and that is out in Siberia and whatnot, and it seemed to allude to collecting of uh, prehistoric um, or like Ice Age animal DNA. But yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. But no, I do think that's a, I think it's a cool idea. Um. I mean, because we talked about this. Is uh, maybe this is what you're about? I'll let you finish that, and then I'll rewind. Well, no, no. Well, because does do, does the do, does most people know? Do we Are you talking about warm bloodedness? 
Yes, I do have that in my head, but also in the sales script, there was the Ankylosaurus in the in the dungeon, right? So like, and that was also supposed to be in a snowy environment. Yeah, I believe. So what was in the sales script as like a castle in a snowy environment, I think eventually became Lockwood's Manor in Northern California, essentially. Sure. But I think it's like that same vibe. But yeah, I think that they were exploring bringing Jurassic into a different look for a while now. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, that was I, that was the what was it? The Grendel Corp, wasn't it? Up in um, Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. In the snowy uh, mount, like built into the mountains. Mm. Well, I think what's really cool is um, what works about snow, though, is it's sort of isolating in the same way that an island is. Um, so you can be out there in the middle of nowhere, like in the tundra of like Siberia. And it's that same sense of isolation. I mean, that's why movies like The Thing work so well, is even though they're on a giant landmass, that's really what it is. It's such a harsh, brutal, giant landmass that it can be unforgiving. And you can find yourself isolated in a pocket of livable area. And uh, I think that's why snow could be such a fun way to play with the Jurassic concept. Is it? It's a very different look and a very different feeling, but at the same time, it does have that sense of turning the um, landscape into a character and... Uh, isolating sure. it and making it uh, unforgiving at times where you really become trapped and uh, it's a fight for survival. It's not like you can just like up and out of there. Yeah. And it could be feathered. You know, if you have a company that's playing with feathered uh, dinosaurs, that could be argued that, you know, provides insulation. Well, that's the thing. So dinosaurs are warm blooded. Um, and we know this, we know that a lot of animals lived in Arctic like environments. Uh, and they they lived in snowy environments like Pachyrhinosaurus actually they believe would uh, frequent snowy like environments and other mm. animals as well. So we do know that these animals were warm blooded, or a a basic something that is parallel to warm bloodedness that eventually became warm bloodedness. Um, but yeah, no, we know that from birds. Uh, and yeah, so maybe not every animal would be suited for uh the cold because you know not every animal in our world is suited for the cold but most mammals uh, most warm-blooded animals can adapt to cold weather um given the opportunity and uh i do think that it's very possible to have the dinosaurs surviving in that type of environment we shall see it's going to be also interesting to see and uh this was another thing i wanted to add about the new york times article was the uh I liked how Colin talked about they have these frisbee sessions every Sunday, mm-hmm. and because everybody's in the hotel, right? And they'll just rehearse their lines while going through their frisbee, and then That's basically unique. enact that throughout the throughout the week. And I, I I'm wondering if if the pandemic in itself is gonna and because of this closed set environment now, which they talked about being similar to you know when there's like basically love scenes that's a, that's a close set mm-hmm. so you have this limited skeleton crew but i wonder if because of that there's going to be this deeper almost less hollywood feel to the film that we're craving so much in a jurassic park film that's going to kind of not that they couldn't have done it before but now they're presented an opportunity to where like things are just a little bit more intimate because of the actual natural surroundings and settings. And, and yeah. maybe, yeah, because they've had all that extra time to build those relationships and spend all that time together, which is something, I mean, even Robert Downey Oops. Jr. was talking about this on a podcast recently where he was talking about his, his exit from the Marvel Universe and saying that it's weird because you spend all this time with these people on the set and you build these relationships, you film your lines, and then up everything after filming up until the premiere you don't see these people they never see each other mm-hmm. and he said it's so it's such a weird feeling because you feel like you should be much closer as people because you spend such an intimate amount of time with them but mm-hmm. those movies have such a fast turnaround and such a a busy schedule and there's so much to cram in maybe yeah maybe this is going to give us more of that feel where you know these characters are friends or they know each other in real life you know something that that's something that the it film the remake of it did really well is that the director took all those kids to like a summer camp thing and and they all spent so much time together so they could become real life friends and that transitions on screen you can see that those kids know each other the way they look and hang around like they're not just acting Mm -hmm. it's it's all that body language and everything and it pays off and maybe as colin described maybe that's something that's really going to pay off in this film 
And it's a good way to or, like work for how everything might organically flow with one another because, you know, films used to have a lot of time in pre-production to bring the cast together, do table reads, and really spend a lot of time working everything out together. But now you normally don't have that happening very often as a group. Either schedules are too tight, the uh, studio wants to pump stuff out too quickly. There's just so many things that are going on that it's harder to get that. And by forcing everybody together, now you have this weird opportunity where the whole cast is together at the same time. Can't can do these line reads that a lot of times the production wouldn't be afforded um, in the same sense. So you are building that sense of just more interactivity and more investment into the behind when the camera's not rolling. And I think that does like it builds a chance of, to build camaraderie. But um, I think it also offers an opportunity so that they can maybe work out the line, the emotion, the logic of um, everything, and everyone can sort of really become involved you know that can maybe sometimes you have too many cooks but at least you're giving the people the opportunity yeah, yeah. to voice things that's exactly what i was going to say though it's like it's for in colin's perspective i almost wonder if this is kind of like a dream scenario because exactly what you just said it's you don't have too many cooks in the kitchen you don't have too many voices trying to point and pull or push and pull you know a specific scene it's it's been it's been intimately i when I say intimately, but you know, like yeah. in, a, in a social setting, talked about um, and agreed upon, basically uh, amongst a small group, and then it's and then it's acted out within that next week, and and um, you know, with with Colin not having to worry about not that producers or people from the studio or execs or anything like that would be one. I don't know how a studio or how behind the scenes works essentially, uh, but I can only imagine that having that sort of like the people you need, the people you trust everybody who needs to be in this room is here boom let's do this is like kind of the ideal setting yeah no i i know i'm pretty sure that this uh the way things are going they've cut down on these studio execs and whatnot because they've tried to cut down on crew on set like if they're not needed to be there they're not there so what you don't have is like all of the different execs representing different things there i'm assuming that there's a producer on site but i don't think sure. you have everybody is on site and on set as much i think that you're given a tighter crew which also in theory awards the creative team a little bit more freedom because they're not constantly having somebody saying, you know, hey, make that scene brighter. We exactly. think that it'll be more marketable because of that as they're watching in real time. You just don't have that. So the art team can really – they can hopefully get their vision out there a little bit more, and maybe they have more time to experiment and more time to improvise. That's not always the best thing on for the final cut of the film but it is a great thing to have the opportunity to try to do sure yeah to give them like room to play as well that's yeah. a really interesting point actually about the lack of studio execs that are going to be on set it really does allow colin to play with this because movie and maybe there's a lot maybe more. maybe this is the dominion that, that maybe this is the jurassic film that he really wanted to make and like studio execs on set like there's a lot more happening there than i think people realize like for yes. big films like this, there are a like lot this. of people that you don't see on like you're, the Blu-ray making ofs aren't going to show you these this part of the filmmaking aspect because nobody wants to hear a studio exec change a scene because they think the name of a dinosaur is more marketable actually uh, for selling toys or something like that. Like that sort of takes like takes a little bit of the fun out of it when you're like when you hear them like yeah light the scene more yeah that looks better but light it more because we think it'll work better in commercials yeah and it's like <laughs> and it's those are the battles that uh directors constantly have to fight and uh not just directors it's everyone and sometimes sometimes studio execs can bring in really good notes it's not always bad i don't want to paint them as villainous people but it's a lot of cooks trying to control it's like it's like writers trying to critique uh an illustrator and like there might be critiques that are fair but a lot of times they, it's not the same they're not on the same page and they're doing things just in a different way um and you sometimes you have to let the directors and whatnot like let that creative vision fly take that risk please it's going to be really interesting to see the first real footage from this movie and um, i said on the podcast the other day i, I don't think we're going to see a trailer this year um, but I think some sort of tease in December would be very fitting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think if they want to market this film, they, they're going to have to get a trailer out by December. Yeah, I, I think that we obviously are going to see things pushed back. I mean, we don't even have a poster or, or a logo yet, which is interesting. Um, 
So yeah, but I think that we'll have a trailer uh, of some sort by December. A teaser, a teaser, or something. It could be. Yeah, I, I think there'll be something that will utilize teaser, one of these new locations. So I think it'll be yeah. snow, or they'll they'll really, you know, it might be like a little snowy teaser that shows. Well, we've seen know. the Arcadia logo is snowy mountains. In fact, that's one of the other images that the uh, uh, New York Times put out. And I don't think we have it hosted, but it shows the uh, the medical testing sets. Like section, and you can see the Arcadia logo plastered all over that, which is you know the working title of the film, and it is a it's snowy mountains with uh, what looks like redwood trees or pine trees, and then a pteranodon. I like the kind of concept logo that we've got so far, the one that Amblin put up, the one that was on the on the slate, but yeah, that's not like the logo logo. That's I mean that'd be really cool, but yeah, if it, if it went back and Dominion's logo was just the Jurassic Park logo with Dominion in there that would be <laughs> cool. but um yeah it remains to be seen but I think um yeah this was a really exciting thing that the New York Times did it wasn't Entertainment Weekly I was surprised we talked about that about how that would be the first official you know set pictures would be E.T. but um because this is more about the conditions and the scenario of what they're filming within rather than like the filming of itself yeah so this is more me. of a this piece on set pictures boom These... <laughs> but for them it's more about the you know the breakthroughs of yeah, trying to film on what with what's going on of course and it seems like it's all going well it seems like it's um that they're, they're kind of setting the tone for like how hollywood movies can continue um as we hopefully end up leaving the pandemic but yeah um any more final thoughts on these images guys or this new york times piece um Mm. I just want to point out that we talk very critically, especially on the outpost of the new franchise, but we always, always, <laughs> always turn face because we love this franchise and like what, you know, like the continuation for it. And I have to hand it to Colin that like, I really have seen like this development and he's almost felt, he feels like the dad now of the Jurassic world. And I really think that like, I'm, I'm starting to kind of see this vision that he's, that he has, and it's going to be really interesting to, to see what he does with this next film. But I honestly think in a lot of regard that this is going to be a blessing in disguise. At least I'm always hopeful in the beginning. I could, you know, very well be critical at the end, but um, everything that I'm seeing for this new stuff has just kind of me a little bit more jazzed, if you will for what's ahead and it's not just like with the cast and everything else it's just like i feel like there is kind of becoming this full circle with jurassic park there feels like there's a lot of love behind everything and it does feel like yeah this is a jurassic park film but just like even that arcadia logo like uh ebb tide ancient features none of them really had these types of logos where like everything about this logo is like everywhere over the production even in the compi picture you can see the arcadia like the mountains and whatnot on her uh her neck not her necklace what is it with your id badge on like her lanyard lanyard yeah. yeah um and like i think that there's just like a lot of love like this is a special movie and you can kind of feel it across the board of just the way things are presenting and what we're seeing you can tell it's a it's a big one it's a special one for the people involved there's a lot of love behind it and i think it's bleeding through yeah that's I, that's hard to argue yeah. with colin has always loved what he does and he's always put so much passion into this and every time we've, you know, had the opportunity to meet with him and speak with him, he's so passionate. He's just like us mm -hmm. when it comes to talking about these movies in this franchise. So as well, we all have our own thoughts on Jurassic World and Fallen Kingdom. But I obviously like really, really want Dominion to be the one. I want it to be the one that hits and feels Jurassic and, 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 can, and you know, is the sequel that it should be. And as you said, so far, it seems like it's going in that direction all depends on story and screenplay but um my you know what my hopes are up i'm excited i'm honestly i think we're seeing like a little bit of emily's vision also kind of coming through i mean i mean you know i'm sure that there's some creative creative direction on her part in terms of how this looks and feels but i'm honestly very much like i've got her on the board in terms of like how this movie is going to come out because i'm, I'm super intrigued to see how she how she plays this out i just noticed today as well uh we're recording today on the 14th uh there are officially 300 days left until 
the release date of this movie, Ooh. providing the release date does not change. Yeah. It's 300 days from today, less than a year. Um, I'm... I don't... Uh, do you think they're going to make that date? They're going to have to, right? <laughs> All signs are pointing to it. I mean, everybody's talked about, like, this hasn't really halted much and that they were able to do some post-production during the time down. But... It, I think it's just all dependent on, on theaters. But at the same time, Universal has made that deal. Um, I think in some I think in some regard, Universal is kind of prepping themselves to uh, yeah prepare. I just don't see Jurassic World being a digital release if they can do no everything to prevent that. Like that's got to be experienced in the theater. Also, in terms of post work that needs to be done, that's my big worry as well. Is like, just are they going to have enough time to edit this film and work on the work, and then make sure it needs uh, recording? Like, you know, do they need reshoots or anything like that? Like, there's a lot of pressure, but um, I, I think so. That's one of the things. But like, the way I figure is like, if Halo Infinite could get a indefinite delay into 2021, and that was supposed to be the headlining title on like a new console launch. Uh, and it has a toy line. Some of it's in stores. Some of it was due out in stores next month. Like it's got a lot of big. It's got energy drinks hitting stores next month, and it's probably not coming out to a year from now. Now, um, if that could get delayed, you know, if Jurassic needs the delay in the studio, makes the hard decision. Yeah, I think it could be delayed. Um, I don't think it's untouchable. Uh, even if we get really down to like, oh, it's still two months out, I don't necessarily think it's going to be untouchable. If there's something going on behind the scenes that has been impacted, I could see us getting a delay and not know it's coming until the last minute. Yeah, as is tradition with Universal. But hopefully, whatever they decide, it's right. It's the right for the movie and mm-hmm. not for because but, we want to generate as many ticket sales as we can. It's. It, it, I want. To, I don't want to be watching Dominion and be like, well. That shot was a little flaky, you know. That was a little off. Like, yeah, no, they need see. to nail the visuals of this movie. Like, yeah. they can't delay it. Like, that's something that absolutely needs to be done properly. Take their time with it and please Especially get it right. Especially all the work that's gone into the animatronics. You don't want to have... All of a sudden, you've got these solid animatronics and then every time you transition from that to VFX, it, it kind of falls apart. I think they can hold this up. They've obviously got ILM's best on this one. And, um, yeah, I'm excited for it. I think there is there's a lot of hope there that this this could be this could be great, um, guys. Before I go, I got to mention head to uh, of course the JurassicOutpost.com forward slash store. Uh, we're selling a retro Jurassic collection shirts, uh, posters, all based on James McQuaid's take on the classic Jurassic logo. And we have a new partnership with Frome. You get ten percent off using Jurassic Outpost. They basically do the entire film condensed into one canvas, and it's. Uh, it's pretty goddamn sweet. So check that out. Links in the description. Ryan, Chris, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, man. Absolutely. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been nice to discuss Jurassic again. It Hell yeah. Like a, it feels like another throwback, Ryan. I know. I, I like I said, uh, once once it comes down to like within a year of a Jurassic release, like I'm fully invested. So I come out of the the grassy knolls. <laughs> you come out fighting. <laughs> I come out of the long grass to talk about the uh, to talk about all things Jurassic. It's just always fun to come back and you know continue on the story and and, and theorize where we're going next. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we we'll hope to have you on again soon. Hope to chat with the, three, uh, the two of you. And um, yeah, to those listening, thank you for listening to the In General podcast. Uh, any final thoughts? Hopefully, we have a reason to do this again soon, and like a fun reason. And uh, I'm excited to. Um, Camp Cretaceous comes out in a bit and I'm excited to learn more about that. Alright. Alright. All right.